Okay. Um, while we wait for anyone else who might be coming in, um, oh, got someone, sorry. Right as I was saying that, I'm not really good at like doing different tasks right at the same time. Um, so hello and welcome everyone to the last episode <laughs> of season two. Um, I'm Lindsay Randall, host of the speaker season, uh, speaker series, sorry. Digging In is a series of live presentations with archaeologists from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And if you enjoy our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are able to bring you outstanding programming through support of viewers like you. And today we are very excited to welcome Kimberly Smith. Kim Smith is the Northeast Regional Manager for Gray and Pape uh, Incorporated, located in Providence, Rhode Island. She has been active in archaeology for over 20 years with a passion for understanding and interpreting past human behavior. This talk was inspired by recent archaeological studies completed at the Salem Charter Street Cemetery in Salem, Massachusetts, and the fascination of the development and use of cemeteries in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the chat function, either at the bottom or the side of your Zoom screen. And then we will give our speaker time to answer as many as she can with the understanding that we might not get to all of them. So welcome, Kim, and thank you for joining us today. Well, hello. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending, and thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited, but as I've repeatedly said, and anyone that knows me, eek! <laughs> um, so yeah, as, as the Lindsay had mentioned, this, this talk was inspired by recent restoration and archaeological studies of the Salem Charter Street Cemetery. The studies identified a potentially unique pattern of cemetery detritus that I had not encountered before during the many cemetery restoration and relocation projects in which I've been involved with. And while Salem Charter Street Cemetery has its own land use history and some of the um, land use history, some of the detritus may be associated with nearby earlier occupations and alterations to the property throughout history. Some of it may in fact be related to the practice of Victorian era picnicking and the celebration of life throughout cemeteries in the early 19th and 20th centuries. With that said, I will first provide a discussion on the development of the rural garden cemeteries of the era followed by a general Victorian picnic picnicking practices discussion. And then finally ending with the discussion on the practice of cemetery picnicking in particular and the types of material culture that has been left behind or we may expect to be found as remnants of this practice. So the Victorian era began in 1837. It's named for the new queen and continued through 1901. The Victorian age was a time of expansion, reform, idealism, invention, and entrepreneurial drive, but it was also an age of urbanization. For example, early in Victoria's reign, only 17% of the British population lived in urban centers. By 1891, this percentage increased to 31%. By 1901, a staggering 77% of the population lived in urban city centers. Urban parks and cemeteries were created in response to overcrowding and poor conditions and in a measured response to the Victorian regulation and structure. Cemeteries were constructed due to the need for sanit sanitary disposal of the dead and thankfully their approach did not echo the utilitarian design, but rather they utilized the bucolic design aesthetics with their roots in the late 18th century. Specifically, Bernardin de St. Pierre, championed transforming the commemorative gardens of the time into burial places of the great and good. He denounced churchyards and burials and churches as aesthetically and hygienically indefensible and disgusting. He proposed burial grounds to follow the examples of classical antiquity by developing public cemeteries created within the vicinities of cities, not located directly inside, 
They are to be planted with cypresses, pines, fruit trees, and monuments to induce, quote, tender melancholy to those who visited them. The living would thus, quote, derive benefit from the preambulations of such Arcadian places, whereas any unfortunate who stumbled upon the fetid and revolting churchyards could only experience horror, disgust, and an assault on the sentimental emotions. Overall, these landscapes echoed the elaborate private gardens of the elite, bringing the garden design to a wider public. They provided a reprieve from the congested living spaces of everyday life, and many were designed by the greatest designers and landscape architects of their time. And this is the period of the rise of the landscape architect. In Massachusetts, and actually within the United States as a whole, the first garden cemetery is that of the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. It was founded by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. It was non-denominational. It was designed landscape that was open to the public. It's located outside of the city center at the time, and it included permanent family, family lots. Cities across the country began to use it as a model to create their own rural cemeteries the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn in 1838, and the Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati constructed in 1845 are only two of the many examples. An additional local example could be that of the Oak Grove Cemetery located in Fall River constructed in 1855. Tying this into Salem, Specifically around 1855, Salem, the mayor noted that the old burial places were filled almost to capacity and requested new burial places. By 1871, the Salem Charter Street Cemetery specifically was widened to further accommodate more burials and improvements were made, which included the development of pathways, plantings, and the installation of fencing and boundary walls. If there is one thing Victorians knew, it was that cemeteries were not just for the dead. They were also welcoming places for the living. When one is visiting a cemetery, they should not think only of death and loss, but they are to celebrate the life of their loved ones and consider the living beauty around them. Now once reserved for the wealthy landowners to enjoy on their estates, the Victorians revolutionized the phenomenon of outdoor dining, bringing the picnic to the masses and paving the way for every family to enjoy taking their meals outside. Picnicking gained popularity as it allowed for the escape from the industrialized living spaces of the 19th century and cemetery, cemetery picnicking in particular allowed for the families to come together to revere the dead and focus on the future and health of the family. As a reminder of this time period, the child mortality rate was 47% with nearly 470 children out of 1,000 dying before the age of 10. And the maternal mortality rate was the equivalent of one out of maybe every 100 to 200 people. So in other words, death was a constant visitor for many families. And in cemeteries, people could talk and break bread with the family and friends, both alive and deceased. Now, while picnicking also allowed people an escape of the Victorian parlor etiquette, it did call for its own proper behavior as found in the Victorian etiquette books and household management manuals of the day, such as here on the left, Mrs. Beaton's book of household management from 1861, Mrs. S.D. Powers, Anna Maria's housekeeping from 1885, and Tinney Ellsworth, Manual, Queen of the Household from 1901. In her now famous book of the household management, Mrs. Beaton outlines her bill of fare for a picnic of 40 persons, offering a detailed insight into the components of a Victorian picnic. According to Mrs. Beaton, quote, it is scarcely necessary to say that plates, tumblers, wine glasses, knives, forks, and spoons must not be forgotten, as also teacups, saucers, three or four teapots, some lump sugar, and milk. If this last named article cannot be attained in the neighborhood, take three corkscrews. Victorian picnic fare included a joint of cold roast beef, a joint of cold boiled beef, two ribs of lamb, two shoulders of lamb, four roast fowls, two roast ducks, 
one ham, one tongue, two veal and ham pies, two pigeon pies, six medium-sized lobsters, one piece of collared calf's head, 18 lettuces, six baskets of salad, six cucumbers, stewed fruit well-sweetened and put into glass bottles that must be well-corked, three or four dozen plain pastry biscuits to eat with the stewed fruit, two dozen fruit turnovers, four dozen cheesecakes, two cold cabinet puddings in mold specifically, two blanc manges also in molds, a few jam puffs, one large cold plum pudding, a few baskets of fresh fruit, three dozen plain biscuits, a piece of cheese, six pounds of butter, which if you ask me is quite a lot, four quarter loaves of household bread, three dozen rolls, <laughs> six loaves of tinned bread specifically, this is for tea, two plain plum cakes, two pound cakes, two sponge cakes, a tin of mixed biscuits, and half a pound of tea. Coffee, according to Mrs. Beaton, is not suitable for a picnic being difficult to make. Things also not to be forgotten on a picnic, a stick of horseradish, a bottle of mint sauce, again, well corked, a bottle of salad dressing, a bottle of vinegar, mustard, pepper, salt, good oil, and pounded sugar. And if it can be managed, take a little ice. Beverages included three dozen quart bottles of ale, packed in hampers specifically, ginger beer, soda water, and lemonade of each two dozen bottles, six bottles of sherry, six bottles of claret, champagne, and any other light wine may be preferred, and two bottles of brandy. Water can usually be obtained on site, so it's useless to take. Now in 1884, Mrs. Powers wrote her household management manual called the Anna Maria's uh, Housekeeper. And this also included a chapter specifically on what to take for a picnic. She advocated for the use of camp chairs, mats and swing chairs or hammocks. This is for comfort. 19th century art and photographs show us that picnickers did for some time also bring the, the dining room table. Occasionally an extra wagon was required just for the furniture for picnickers that they dragged along. And let's take a look at the, uh, the photos here on, the, on the, the slideshow. On the top left-hand corner, we have the picnic table, some, some nice furniture on the top right-hand side. We clearly have their more folding furniture, but virtually in the early 19th century, we're talking almost everything but the kitchen sink. Everything from indoors was brought outdoors for this, this picnic. Power noted in her 1885 book that the previous customs of good society from the earlier periods from Mrs. Beaton's time included the packing of fine wares, forks and spoons, but Mrs. Power specifically advocated for the use of unbreakable wooden dishes as they can be acquired cheaply and they do, you do not have to fret about their return. She says all food should be easy to handle, including rolls filled with salad, which is at this time, salad is cold cooked beef, ham, chicken finely chopped and mixed together with mayonnaise or salad dressing. And however, if you must follow the earlier good society rules, you could pack sandwiches comprised of sliced bread, specifically unbuttered, and these would be filled with slices of meat. But these, of course, would require that use of that pesky plate, knife, and fork, which she prefers not to have to carry. Power also recommended plain bread and butter for those who preferred it, chunks of cheese, and cold sliced ham, tongue, or chicken, all of which can fit neatly in a tin. For a colorful garnish or a side dish, she suggested pickles. Let's remind you that in this time, pickles are not only pickled cucumbers as we are aware of today, but it also included pickled vegetables, chutney type preserves, or even preserved fruits. Now, Mrs. Power says, and I no, I shall not forget the cake. And you may depend on it being the only thing the other people will not forget either. And she strictly recommends a pound cake, fruit cake, or sponge cake. So cakes are very important for the picnic. To wash down this feast, Power proposed cold tea flavored with sugar and lemon, 
or lemonade made right at the picnic grove by mixing the syrup of lemon juice and sugar with ice water. The syrup and the water were to be packed and brought separately with them placed in a jar set in a wooden pail to be strained through a linen cloth and to make the lemonade on site. Iced milk with cream may be taken in jugs, she says, but the preferred carrying method is that you pack those jugs and bottles into firkins or half barrels as they are easier and more portable to carry. Once again, hot tea or coffee was determined as unnecessary, but if you must have some, she says, do not forget to carry your kerosene stove. Some people preferred wine such as the chilled claret, but Power specifically states that she thinks healthy air, fresh air was stimula stimulation enough for one's digestion. I will add that Mrs. Power's chapter is specifically about church picnics, so there's probably some bias. Now, Tinny Ellsworth Manual, Queen of Household in 1901, advised the use of hammocks and camp chairs as well. She says meat should always be arranged for fingers rather than fork eating because, and I quote, nature did not make forks. This included fried chicken and breaded veal and lamb chops closely and carefully trimmed and sandwiches with, for her, buttered bread filled once again with salad. Candied and dried fruits and a sponge and pound cakes were the recommended dessert, though fresh fruits are also agreeable. A common thread amongst all of these etiquette guides was that wine maybe wasn't as necessary, although Miss Beaton obviously liked her wine, but the rest say it's not necessary al fresco as the exhilaration of the air should be stimulation enough for digestion. Miss Ellsworth follows up her smorgasbord of foods by stating that one must not forget the napkins, the forks, the spoons, cloth, tumblers, plates and cups and handles, no saucers this time, for the tea and the coffee, salt and pepper, sugar, a bottle of cream, and a can of condensed milk. So if we can take a minute to go back through some of these photos from the previous slides, we kind of can see a little bit of an evolution of the picnic of its time. We start in the earlier to mid 19th century. We're bringing virtually everything but the kitchen sink. The proper etiquette of quote unquote good society requires you bring your your good wares, your dinner wares, your relish dishes, the multiple teapots. We're talking the fine china you're bringing outdoors. All you're doing is taking your etiquette from indoor, outdoors. As time progressed, we're looking at making things more portable. We are starting to lay down blankets. We're actually sitting on the ground. However, for comfort purposes, per Ms., uh, both Ellsworth and Powers, you may want to bring your hammocks and some foldable chairs, but we start to see the use of the actual picnic baskets and things are definitely more portable. We're also seeing the use of more um, tin, less ceramics, maybe some more um, picnic um, sandwiches are wrapped in paper if they're sandwiches. So things definitely evolved from the early 19th century to, towards the, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. As you can see, and as you've heard, the Victorian picnic was a very civilized affair. There was obviously dress codes involved as well. I did not go into that, but they definitely discuss the proper attire. Everything was codified. <laughs> it was formal society. Um, not only were they having these affairs by bringing the indoor meals and the etiquette outdoors, it was also recommended that they have these picnics minimally once a week to escape the burdens of life. Remember, this is the industrial revolution where we're getting outside, we're getting fresh air. The picnic evolved over time, as we said, um, it develops from early the mid 19th century etiquette was very formal with the use of the furniture, fine wares, sauce dishes, tumblers, form, formal cuts of meat that are carried with them. But by the late 19th century to early 20th century, the picnic became portable using the packable chairs, cloths, finger foods specifically. Cemetery picnicking remained a cultural staple into the early 20th century, which at that time is when public parks really began to sprout up across the nation, as well as the problem of cemeteries are starting to deny picnics and the use of their, their cemeteries. In fact, as this admittance ticket from the Woodland Cemetery, Number three over here, circled in red, it says persons with refreshments will not be permitted to enter. 
This has clearly been an issue for some time. Even Miss Power in her manual describes that the debris, instead of disfiguring the grounds, should be collected in a box and taken away. And even today, 100 years later, we have an issue where many cemeteries actually have a policy in place that will not allow you to picnic within the cemeteries. Here is a news article from the conservative in Denver from 1900. Um, it says right here, a remarkable fad sprang up in Denver of going to the cemeteries for picnics. It became such a nuisance that thousands strew the grounds with sardine cans, beer bottles, and lunch boxes that police interference was contemplated. If you read further on, they didn't actually call the police, but this was a problem. Leaving behind garbage, detritus associated with the picnicking activities was in fact real. So we've gotten this far. What does it mean for the cultural materials or artifact patterning associated with Victorian picnic practices? For one, in cemeteries, the artifacts potentially associated with picnicking activities appear likely to be concentrated immediately adjacent to the gravestones, or they're found along the periphery of the cemeteries, perhaps as secondary deposits where the detritus has been pushed in lieu of a complete cleanup. Let's take a brief moment and we'll we'll talk about some of these photographs here. For the first, for the most part, these photographs show the consumption of food directly adjacent to the, the gravestones. On the top left-hand corner, we have individuals consuming food, leaning up against the markers, which is not advisable, especially for preservation efforts. Um, on the bottom left-hand side, we have, it's a later, it's definitely 20th century, so we're looking post-Victorian, but I couldn't find of the time, but we have people <laughs> picnicking on a tomb or on, on a grave. Um, and even at that time, they're still bringing their plates. I see some, I see tumblers, I see some teaware. So they're still consuming food. They're still coming to the cemeteries, they're picnicking and they're right there adjacent to the, the fam what is likely a family member. And even on the, the bottom right hand side, we have them maybe right outside the gate of a cemetery or maybe that's right outside the family plot in particular, partaking in a picnic and picnicking activities. But again, these similar types of materials, so they're, they're bringing their different uh, boxes and woods. They have some condiments, um, glassware, jars, jugs, bottles over there still 20th century, but they're, they're consuming right in the cemetery or adjacent to it. The top right hand picture I thought was kind of fascinating. It just shows a contemporary picture, um, mid 19th century of just the sheer numbers of people visiting cemeteries at this time. So in addition to actual pic picnicking debris, you're likely to encounter um, other paraphernalia just from visitation, different coins, maybe a lost button, maybe a lost ring, et cetera. So from here, the archeological remains of Victorian picnicking practices include specifically, we're talking about fragments of tumblers, cups, saucers, plates, relish dishes, cans, including that horrid <laughs> sardine can that was very problematic in the Denver um, news article and a, a couple other articles I came across. We have jars that are from pickled goods or chutneys, but also condiment jars, um, bottles from refreshments as well as sauces. We have fruit pits. And we also have the, the faunal remains from different cuts of meats and the, the fried chicken or other lamb and veal that is brought into the cemeteries. So it's just a general discussion on some of the material remains and what they would have looked like, tumblers and and specifically, um, there's a couple photos here. If you guys are not aware of the Jefferson Patterson Museum in Maryland, they have associated also with the Mac Lab. They have an amazing resource online with tons of artifact photos, diagnostic uh, photographs of different artifacts throughout the um, throughout history. Amazing photographs here we're taking from there. The examples of the tumblers would have been colorless, leaded, press molded, paneled, engraved, or plain tumblers. I don't believe on the right top right hand side there's one with some nice etchings. I highly doubt people are bringing their fine material goods into the cemeteries, unless it is early 19th century, then they're supposed to, based on good society rules and etiquette, 
bring their fine wares. But otherwise, I think we're looking a little bit more at something a little more um, simple and accessible. On this slide, we're showing some of the, the plates, the cups, saucers, and even teapots that are identified. The top right hand uh, photograph comes from the Jefferson Patterson Museum as well that shows some of the, the edged refined earthenwares that would be expected from the, from the time period. And then the other photos are actually from the Salem Charter Street Cemetery. We have an array of small hand painted edge transfer printed refined earthenwares. Notice these are these are highly fragmented. Yes, we recognize that there was some level of historical land use. They didn't expand the cemetery until 1877. Yes, there was some um, properties along the adjacent area of these Charter Street Cemetery, but it did pique my interest at the number of material goods, maybe the fragmentation and the fact that we do have this Victorian practice that these may be remnants of it. The other thing to note again is that they're they're extremely small, they're fragmented. My guess, and this is all it really is, is that people would not have left large plates behind. Typically what might have been left behind is essentially garbage. They chipped or they broke and they, they cracked their, their china. Maybe small fragments of it remained in, that they did not pick up at the larger pieces. Maybe they would take back if they were mendable, maybe they would have taken on the mended it. Um, this is also dependent on other factors such as the socioeconomic status and the accessibility of goods in an area. Um, what type of material remains would they leave behind? We also have some of these on, on here specifically, some of the white granite and undecorated refined earthenware, some plain, plain, plain wares that they would bring along with them. Condiment jars, pickling jars, crocks and bottles. You know, we talked about <laughs> every etiquette book talked about bring your salt and your pepper. We did in fact find a salt shaker head out there. Um, there's a couple fragments of crocs and bottles, maybe um, sardine crocs were used in the mid, mid 19th century, as well as the pickling crocs for the various, you know, actual pickles or pickled vegetables. On the bottom, we have an example of the different varying types of bottle glass. They, we talk about different ales, we talk about different wines brought in. And then other detritus that would be found might be all associated with what we, we see here, the different picnic baskets. Um, we did not in fact find silverware, but it's possible that you would find different um, cutlery associated with picnicking, maybe fragments of tin. We obviously talked about the sardine box, the sardine tins, other tins, biscuit tins, things might've been inadvertently left behind. So I guess in short, I want to have this conversation about the, the varying, material culture that could be left behind from Victorian practices. To date, I have not seen this discussion in the archaeological record and literature, um, but clearly the cultural practice was there and it was problematic to the point where people were publishing newspaper articles that stop leaving your trash in our cemeteries. There are numerous articles that literally are saying that please clean up after yourselves when in our cemeteries. So this is something to think about for the archaeological record. And not only in cemeteries, this applies elsewhere if you're working in a park or you're working in an area that is nice hill overlooking a beautiful scenery. And you start finding random fragments. Who knows, maybe you have an example of Victorian era picnicking. So thank you. Well, thank you, Kim. That was really great. Um, so if people have questions for Kim, you can uh, send them in the chat to me. Um, I actually have uh, some questions already. So why do you think this is not a subject that archaeologists have really focused on? I don't really have an answer to that. I wonder if people just immediate, a lot of these could be, the connection could be tenuous at best. They might have a better connection of like, oh, there's an extant structure that was next door. This is just refuse associated with that structure. Or really, I don't know, fill practices, but I, I think it's a legit possible artifact pattern. 
that exists. I also wonder if it's because <laughs> typically when archaeologists are in cemeteries, it's to remove bodies. So like you're just yeah. focused on like the grave shaft and what's in there and being respectful and moving it, you know, to somewhere safer or whatever, right? Like you're not I, typically totally. doing the other areas in a cemetery. Yeah, totally. And and how many archaeological excavations are also really going on in cemeteries? You know, there's there's a few, but not too many. Yeah, typically we do not want to find human remains. So no. <laughs> and when we know where they are, we don't want to go near there. Um, another question is um, makes me think of Lucy Ma Montgomery, the Anna yes. Gable, uh author, has lots of actual like short stories where like the whole town will go, you know, caretake cemeteries. So did you find in any of your research where in addition to the picnicking, would they also do you know, like, I think I went up, you know, Memorial Day weekend for my family and we clipped some of the bushes, you know, uh, we kind of put flowers down and caretaked our family plots. Did you find that as part of the picnicking? Yes, there's actually a significant amount of postings in newspapers for the church, church picnic that coincides with the cemetery cleanup. <laughs> oh, okay. So there's a significant amount of that that, it, that has occurred. Okay. Um, in terms of the Salem uh, charter, was it the plates that you found the um, highest number of artifacts for or? So Salem was interesting. Um, yes, we found a significant amount of plate debris. A lot of the debris that we found at Salem was largely pushed to the back end. We do know that they did land modifications out there. They leveled it multiple times in the 1890s. So I don't know if that's a product of um, of the grading activities at that time, or if this is just how they decide to handle their trash. Um, yes, it was plates. We had some other random things. We did have, uh, I forgot to mention, but we had um, Rockingham Ware teapot fragments out there. So they were, there's definitely that. There were some other awesome um, pre dating. Is that a the, cat? Uh, yes, we I know. Cats. Sorry. I'm trying no, to never be away. sorry. We love <laughs> um, some of the Galt Pickman house is there on the right hand corner. There was actually refuse associated with that 17th century occupation there and some trash pits. So mm -hmm. there is clearly some preservation in that cemetery. So I don't know for sure what level of grading and if that affected this patterning or not. Okay. We have another question uh, related to the Salem uh, Charter Street. Um, so what necessitated you and Gray and Pate going into the cemetery? So Salem and they just reopened, they were restoring their cemetery, they were fixing their walkways and with the intent to have people very focused walking on the pathways instead of walking throughout the cemetery walking immediately adjacent to stones anything to kind of help the navigation to, to preserve the cemetery in a better manner. Um, also, in celebration of anniversaries, they wanted to add some some lighting to make it a little bit safer and some plants to, to beautify it. So it was really in need of some restoration process. And as a result, before they can make any ground disturbing activities occur, we needed to make sure that we knew where the graves were because per usual, there's always unmarked burials out there. In every single cemetery, you will encounter that. We also needed to know what the depth of the burials were as some of the earlier bur burials often aren't buried as deep as you'd like to think. Um, some of the, the winter burials, you know, it's kind of dig a hole and put someone in, it's cold, the ground is frozen, I can only do so much. So yeah, we needed to make sure that they were not going to adversely affect the resources. Okay, uh, we had a couple more questions come in. So the trash problem hasn't changed uh, much, but it is more biohazardous stuff like syringes. Yeah. The needles get picked up, but I hate to think of the things archeologists are going to find in a hundred years. Is there any evidence of that kind of behavior back then? Or is this new behavior? I personally have not encountered any evidence of that, nor in any of the news, the historical newspapers. Now I did kind of stop glancing at newspapers post like, probably about 1930. I, I really stopped paying attention. So I don't know if it's a, a modern phenomenon or if there isn't a historical um, coincidence of it as well. Okay. 
Um, another question is, do you think or could it be possible some isolated finds found in parks could be related to Victorian picnicking? Absolutely. I think a lot of us just write it off as, oh, someone dropped something here without fully thinking about why, <laughs> you know, are you bringing your fine china into a park, you know? And I, I, I do believe that we've missed identifying this pattern. Excellent. Well, those are the questions we had for you, Kim. So thank you. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you in August when uh, season three starts on Wednesday, August 11th with Caroline Gardner. And again, we rely on the support of viewers like you. So consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. So again, thank you, Kim. This was wonderful. This is awesome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.